Oh Lord my God When I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout The universe displayed Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee How great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee How great Thou art How great Thou art Then sings my soul
we praise you, Lord God. Lord God, thank you for fighting our battle for us. God, thank you that we can run to you, our defender, our savior. When darkness closes in on every 
so grateful for your kingship Lord that we don't have to worry about thrones and dominions on this uh, earth on this planet Lord because we know that you rule as king over all Father this morning help us to recognize that help us to recognize that we live uh, for a, a king in a different kingdom Lord help us to remember today that we are ambassadors here on this earth to reflect an entirely different kingdom one that is not of this world. Lord, give us uh, today just your, your heart, your mind, uh, your spirit, God, as we would submit to what the word of God says and not just um, be repulsed by it or say, well, here's what I think. God, we want to know what you think today. And so, God, give us your word. Thank you that you wrote it down for us. Thank you that we have it, that we can learn it, know it, memorize it, and most importantly, God, live by it. So God, help us, help us today to live according to your will, according to your word. You wrote it down for us for a reason. So God, help us today to live by your word. We give you all honor, glory, and praise. It's the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said. Amen, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat and turn your attention to the screens. What's up, church? My name is Kevin, and I serve as one of the pastors here at Calvary Oceanside. I love being together with you as the CCO family. One of the ways we worship is through our giving, where we give just a little bit back for everything Jesus has given us. We are grateful for the faithful and generous giving by you, church, to the work of the Lord. It allows us to impact our community and our world as we seek to make disciples of Jesus. If you're new with us today, do not feel obligated to give. Be our guest, be encouraged, and enjoy the service as we continue to worship God together. If you'd like to make an offering, you can do so via the CCO app, website, or boxes here in the sanctuary. Let's pray. Lord God, we just want to give you this time of worship in all that we have and all that we are. We pray that you would bless these resources and further the gospel by the power of your spirit and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Jacob and welcome to Calvary Oceanside. If you haven't already, Please be sure to meet one of our welcome team members out front and in the lobby so we can meet you and get you plugged in. First off, we wanted to let you know that the upcoming Oceanside Outreach will be on May 27th. This is a perfect opportunity to step out in faith and out of your comfort zone to intentionally make disciples. Next, the youth are taking a classic approach to fundraising for summer camp and will be selling lemonade out front every Sunday in May. 100% of the proceeds support the youth and their summer camp funds and you also get a refreshment in the process. Pretty sweet. And speaking of the youth, Calvary Theater Arts is hosting their next youth production titled The Peter Plan. We have two shows at the beginning of June, one on Friday the 2nd in the evening, and another on Saturday the 3rd in the morning. So pick up your complimentary tickets out front at the table and meet the directors of the play as well. Then finally, we want to invite you to take a 10-day tour with us as we journey through Thessalonica, Philippi, Corinth, and much more as we journey in the footsteps of Paul. If you're interested, we have an informational meeting next Sunday, May 28th, where you can ask all the questions you need. That'll do it for this week's announcements. Thanks for joining us today. You can visit the website to find out even more about any events and ministries we talked about today, plus so much more. We love you, church. Now stand up and say hello to someone you've never met before.
Good morning, church family. One of these days, you're going to get so comfortable, you're actually going to venture out of your section to actually, you're like, I got enough time to go. And each time, we're just going to keep increasing the amount of time you can go to a different section. Uh, good morning, church. Good to see you guys this morning. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here at Calvary Oceanside. Um, before we dive in, again, we're going to be in the Word of God today. We're going to be in Titus chapter 3. So if you guys have a Bible, go ahead and pull those out, or you can grab one of the credenzas up here. I've, I've been told they're credenzas. Yes, I'm working on my vocabulary these days. So we've got them in the back and uh, also in the front. So if you want to grab one of those, you're more than welcome to as well. We always encourage you to download the CCO app where you will find the Bible we use along with the fill-in notes to keep you on track. Uh, real quick, just wanted to make an announcement. First and foremost, for all the guys who are here today without their wives who are at the women's retreat, this is my favorite day to see what children are wearing. <laughs> it's my favorite day to just... just people watch and see like if they've got matching anything or just the fact that they made it today is all that it's needed. So again, always grateful for that. Always grateful for the guys who uh, are able to send their, uh, again, I'm, I'm rolling solo right now, right? It's uh, four kids and just trying to make it happen. So uh, super grateful for all the people in my life that help out. I uh, wanted to talk real quick about something that is oh, it's just been brewing in my heart for many years and you can now see it to my left and your right, uh, we're going to start doing puppet shows. I'm kidding. We're not doing that. <laughs> You're like, what in the world? Um, this is something that uh, just for, for years I have really desired to have uh, as part of our church and really as part of our order of service uh, on a regular basis. Behind that curtain, and you'll start seeing it more, I would say, in the next few weeks. It should be done mid-June to the end of June. That is a a baptistry or a baptismal. We're going to start doing baptisms during services, which I'm really, really excited about. Um, I'm, listen, we are a spoiled people. Some people are like, why can't you just do it at the beach? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, it's cold. <laughs> a lot of times that water's cold. We don't want to give everybody a wetsuit uh, in the name of Jesus. We want people to get baptized. But there's two things that happen uh, when you have a baptism during a service. One, the person getting baptized recognizes that they're part of something way bigger. They see that there's a whole family of God that are there to celebrate, to acknowledge, and to just be excited about what God is doing in their life. Secondarily, it's an encouragement for us to see that God is still on the move, that God is still saving people, that God is not done yet. Amen? And so that is something that I've just been really excited about. So there's a bathroom backstage. There's a, there's a changing room backstage. And so my hope is that uh, within the next few months, we will have baptisms during our time of worship. Uh, and just what a sweet time that's going to be to celebrate with the newness of life that God brings to us. And also, the re one of the, the other big reasons why I wanted to do it is because our deacons are, are saying thank you right now. Uh, they haven't said it to me personally, but I do know that for years, they've set up a portable baptistry, and it's like a awful Lego set, and uh, it, it, it's, it's pieces, you put it together, and then there's a liner, and then they have to fill it with water, and then it's got to be heated, and then you baptize people, and then once it's done, then you have to empty it out with a pump, and then you have to dry it off and tear it down and take it back upstairs, and it's just, it's a pain, and uh, for, for me, I've got, you know, just uh, my heart goes out to them. I've got compassion on them because it's, it's, it's a drudge. So this will be here at all times, and uh, you may find me studying in it. It's got a, some jets, and no, I'm kidding. It's not, it's not that. <laughs> but I'm really excited for what God's going to do with that. So be in prayer for that. We're also uh, in the process. There's some construction in the back. We're um, re reformatting, uh, retrofitting our uh, current kitchen uh, in the family sanctuary to be a commercial kitchen so we can do uh, some more catering and some things like that. Not, we're not a catering service, don't get me wrong, but when we have events here, we can start doing things and be legal. So that being said, why don't you guys grab your Bibles? Again, Titus chapter 3. Uh, today is kind of uh, just a continuation of this series. If you've been with us for this series, it's the Blueprints for a Healthy Church. And what we talked about last week was grace. And if you hadn't heard that message, I, I encourage you to receive God's grace and listen to it. I believe God has a lot for us there. But Today, we switch gears. Paul, Paul really starts determining or, or demonstrating to us through a declarative statement what it is that we are supposed to do as we conduct ourselves in this world, how we are to be, how we are to act. 
what should our posture be in the world? Because again, we are, as I said in my prayer earlier, we are Christians, which means we are identified by a different king and a different kingdom. Meaning, this world is not our home. This, like, if, if, if you're longing for the things of this world, that means you think that this is your home. And I'm telling you, this is not your home. We've been bought with a price, and so we are to serve and reflect and point people to the God of a different kingdom. And my question is this. I was, I was at Costco the other day, and I recognized it was a very interesting thing. I saw right next to, uh, you know, kind of the outdoor stuff, there were two items being sold. One was bug spray. Now, if you know what bug spray is, and again, specifically in this text, it was a, it was a, a context, it was a mosquito spray. What that acts is, there's some sort of chemical, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's a repellent. It repels the bugs and the mosquitoes to keep you from getting bit and having a miserable time out at the park or wherever it is that you go to. Right next to that was a bug trap. And what that is, is an attractant. It draws you in through CO2, UV light. There's something about that mechanism that draws people in. My question that I really want to start out today is, what are you in this world as a disciple of Christ? Are you a repellent or are you an attractant? Do people say about you, they're the reason I'm not a Christian? Or do people say about you, they got something different and I want to know what that is? This is the question that we all should ask because this is what Titus is being told by Paul that the conduct that we have in this world needs to be such that it draws people in. So if you're able to, would you stand with me as we give honor to the reading of God's word? We're in Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And it says this, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show hospitality and courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Father, there's so many ways that we could be in this world. Lord, I ask that we would reflect you. Lord, I, I pray for everyone in here today. God, there's not a single one of us who acts perfectly. So God, wherever it is that you would like to point your righteous and holy light in our lives today, would you do that? Would you show us how we are to live in this world to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus? In your precious name, everybody said, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. So first I want to just join in with Paul and reminding you. I think it's very fitting that Paul tells Titus, remind your people. Remember, Paul is the apostle. He's a prolific church planner at this point. He's raising up a lot of pastors. And so he raised up Titus. Titus is now planting several churches, home churches, on an island called Crete. And so Paul tells Titus, remind them, which is that mindset that we must have to be reminded constantly. Why do we need to be reminded constantly? Because we forget. Right? There's a reason why we're not supposed to just read through the Bible once and be like, well, that's good. It was a good read. All good here. We all, as we continue in God's word, as we continue to read it, you know as well as I do, if you spend any length of time in the word of God, we often say, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, man, I used to memorize that one. Oh, I need to memorize that again. We need to be reminded constantly because we forget. Now, listen, this is not everyone's favorite section of Scripture. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Some of you are like, I don't know. Now, let me just make sure we understand most of us don't like that word submissive. It's like a, a, a Christian swear word for many people. They just don't like it. It grates against our spirit because here's the thing, and here's what we need to recognize Submission only happens when you disagree. You don't have to submit to things you agree with. If my wife and I agree on where to go to dinner, which doesn't happen ever, (laughs) if we, this miracle of miracles, we agree, she doesn't go, I'll submit to you. She doesn't have to. We're in agreement. 
Submission only has to take place when there is disagreement. And so what this means is, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to tell you something you probably already know. Some of you guys disagree with how this country is being run. A couple of you, one or two, you don't have to show your hands, it's fine. Some of us disagree with how things are run. Some of us disagree with the decisions that leaders and rulers make, and yet... Paul tells Titus, remind them to be submissive to them. I don't like this. I don't want this. I don't want it to say that. You mean, remind them to be submissive to the rulers and authorities only when you're in agreement. Otherwise, it's time to fight. No, it doesn't say that, nor does it say that in the Greek. But I want to be clear. I want to make sure that everyone's clear so I'm not misquoted tweeted about. I don't care what it is. I want to make sure y'all understand this. I will never submit when they are calling us or me or this church to do something that goes against the word of God. This is our authority, church, right? We all know this. We all know that. But when they're not calling us to do something that violates the word of God, even if we don't like it, called to submit to it. Now, this is hard, but again, remember, Paul's talking to Titus, who was on an island called Crete, and it says in Titus chapter 1 that these guys are evil, lazy gluttons. Not exactly a glowing, you know, report about these people that he has to serve under, that he has to build a church underneath in their community. And at the same time, he still says that this is what they should do. We are called to obey God over men. And this brings up all kinds of situations where over the centuries, Christians have done nutty things in the name of God, horrendous things. And listen, we can't go down that road. But specifically, I've seen this. I've seen this in, in Christian circles where Christians refuse to pay their taxes because they say, well, I, th th those are my tax dollars and I'm not going to see them go to these ungodly things. I get it. I get it. The government does some ungodly things with our tax dollars. But are we responsible for that? Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God's what is God's. Now here, I understand the angst about it, but let me just carry that logic out. Let's say you're an employer and you pay your employee a wage. And then you find out that that employee has gone to use that money for debauchery for pornography, strip clubs, all sorts of nonsense, paid for an abortion with it. Are you responsible for what they did? You're not. Nor are we responsible for what the government does with our tax dollars. They will have to give an account. I have to give an account to be faithful and submissive to my rulers as long as they're not calling me to do anything ungodly or renounce my faith. Our responsibility is to be salt and light to call balls and strikes, to live as citizens of a different kingdom that will influence this kingdom. Our responsibility, church, I'll tell you, here's one, is to vote. Too many Christians, the, the statistics are about one-third of those who call themselves Christians don't vote. Now, I've said it a lot of times before, if you don't vote, you can't complain. But I'll tell you what, I can complain. I can complain that you're not voting. Is that today is not a good excuse. Was that yesterday that we were supposed to vote? Oops, I lost my ballot. It's not a good excuse. If you have, and what we have as citizens of this country, we have a responsibility. And listen, we are going to vote biblically and let God take care of the rest. We're going to trust God for the rest. Because that's what he's called us to do, to li live in submission. But listen... If we're going to reflect biblical values, we need to vote with biblical values. This is one of the reasons we have our salt and light ministry here, to educate you, us, on who and what to vote for. I mean, sometimes it gets, it's nuts, right? You know, with all the wordsmithing that goes on to make the negative seem positive and the positive seem negative, it's hard. But that's why God has given us minds. We were talking about loving God with our minds. This is something that God's called us to do, that we'd educate ourselves on these things. Ecclesiastes 10.44, again, speaking towards these things, listen to what, what, what's said. The wisdom of Solomon said here, for if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offense to rest. 
What a beautiful thing. Because again, our natural tendencies and proclivities is to become outraged, to become angry, to become very vocal. The wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of God, right? Because God gave the wisdom to Solomon, says that if the anger of the ruler rises against you, chill out. Stay in your homes. Calmness will lay great offense to rest. Again, say it again. As long as they're not telling you to sin, renounce your faith, you're in good standing. It's a good place. But here comes the caveat, because I know you're going to ask it. But what about matters of conscience, Pastor? What about if what they're asking me to do doesn't violate God's laws or God's standards, but it violates my conscience. Because we know, scripturally speaking, in James, whoever knows what to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. So if God says, here's my standard, he tells you, right, some of you have a standard, you don't drink alcohol. Cool. Others of you do. The the rule is, if it's a personal conviction that God has given you, remember, God hasn't given everyone your personal conviction. You may have a personal conviction that's not in Scripture, and that's okay. God's good, but God has not called you to proselytize or try to convert everyone to your opinion, nor do we have to get crazy when things pop off in our culture when things are violating a matter of conscience. Not everyone's going to have the same conviction that you do, especially on third and fourth tier issues. Right? You've heard me talk about this. There are closed-handed issues, things that we will not let go of, things that are essential to understanding the gospel and salvation. Won't let go of those. Come hell or high water, gun to my head, not letting go. But then there's secondary issues, tertiary issues, fourth bucket issues. There's things down the line that don't necessarily reflect on salvation, but they are and maybe can be personal convictions. And let me tell you this, secondarily, if God is calling you to take a stand against something that violates your conscience, you had better do it. Now, some of you say, well, well, if I do that, this will happen. Don't you think God's big enough? This is, again, let's let's go back to the pandemic for a little while. I know some of you are like having PTSD right now. Listen, let's go back just a little bit. I remember people coming up to me the entire time. My employer says that I have to take the vaccine. Okay. Well, what should I do? You've got to make a decision. Does it violate your conscience? It does. So don't take it. Well, they said I'm going to get fired. Okay. Well, what do I do? Get fired. Now, again, that sounds intense, but there are a lot worse things in this world than getting fired from a job and having to find a new one. All of us, I would say in this room, who've been employed have gotten fired, let go, or quit and had to find a new job. It's not the worst thing in the world especially if it means that you would violate your conscience to not do that. Sometimes we need to stand for what we think is right, but that doesn't mean that everyone has to stand with you. If God is calling you to do that, you had better do that. Now, if it's just getting angry, we'll look at that in a moment. We've got to be careful because, again, not everyone's conscience is the same as yours. But then he calls us, and again, this is where he he goes in a little deeper, that this love of or respect or submission to rulers and authorities is going to prepare you to be obedient, ready for every good work. So obedience is the name of the game that we are to be submissive to the rulers and authorities so that we are ready for every good work. Ready to be obedient for every good work. The end of verse two, he's telling us that this good work boils down to the posture of the heart. Let me ask you, dear church, are you looking for a fight? Are you angry? Like, are you just boiling on the inside? Ready for the drop of a hat to just pop off? Are you, are you looking to pick a fight? Are you fighting the wrong things and in the wrong way? Ephesians 6.12, you've heard this many times. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We're not fighting against them. We're fighting against the enemy that is using them as a tool. We have to recognize who the real enemy is. If we put that the enemy is people, we're missing, and listen, Satan's going to have a victory because we end up attacking people and not the enemy. We're putting our ammunition down the wrong range. 
we're not putting it in the right place. Again, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So again, it's this obedience that Paul is talking about. The obedience to Christ means that we have to recognize who the real enemy is and fight with the right weapons. I mean, you, you, again, you, you've heard it, never, never bring a knife to a gunfight because it's not going to work. You have to know the weapons and you have to know when to use certain weapons. Like when you look at all of the weapons that we have, if you go to Ephesians where we look at the armor of God, everything's defensive except the sword of the spirit. Helmet, breastplate, gird in the loins, shoes, they're all protective but then we have the sword of the Spirit, so we need to be filled, and we'll look at this in a moment, with the Word of God. If we don't have the Word of God, we're not going to be able to combat the enemy. And let me tell you, church, this is one of those sections of Scripture that we need to be ready in because the Lord is calling us to be submissive and obedient. And then he goes in deeper. This is where it gets, verse 2, to speak evil of no one. Ah. How many of y'all are hoping that I say, well, in the Greek, it doesn't really mean that. <laughs> I was hoping it didn't say that. To speak evil of no one? I mean, except if they've like really made you angry. No one. In the Greek, it means no one. To speak evil of no one? Now, let me be clear. I know some people are saying, wait a minute. Come on, pastor. Tell me. Tell me it doesn't exactly mean that. I will give you a small caveat. The word here in the Greek is blasphemo, which again, you have heard the word blaspheme. It invokes speaking falsely, insultingly, or in a way to curse someone. You're like, ah, I got my out. I can speak truth. And if it hurts, tough. How many of y'all are truth tellers? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of y'all in your heart? Y'all, I just speak the truth. You do whatever that does. I mean, did it hurt? You don't like truth then. Once in a while, we've got to recognize that truth is fine, but truth without love is brutality. If you do not speak the truth in love, seeking to build up, restore, correct in love, you're just bashing people with a two by four. Right? Jesus says that we are to take care of the speck in our own eye before we go, or take care of the two by four in our own eye before we go taking out the speck in our brother's eye. Why? Because... <laughs> And we'll get to this in a moment as well. We were once there. That was once us, but we are to speak evil of no one. And this is, a, this is really just a call to watch what we say when we speak. That we should be wise before we use our words to lash out at others. But this leads to the next characteristic, to avoid quarreling. What is quarreling? The Greek word here means one who is opposed to peace. You, you got people in your life that are opposed to peace? Listen, I'll tell you what, I love peace. Oh, I love peace. Now, I don't love peace at the expense of truth, but I love peace. Meaning, I love to diffuse, to bring down, to ratchet down. I'll speak truth, but I'm not here to speak truth just to knock it over people's heads. In my home, I have four children, so peace sometimes is hard to come by. I love it, but sometimes it's not always that great. But I love to diffuse, but there are other people who are constantly stuck in getting worked up. Some of you here, maybe you're that type of person. You love to get worked up about things. You want that guy. Go ahead, cut me off. See what happens. It gets you tingling. Get you feeling it. You're ready to go. Oh, you did it now. And we get fired up and we, we don't want to avoid this quarreling. The word here means to avoid those and avoid those people who are constantly looking for a fight. I would love to recommend a book to you. There's a, a book by a, a mentor of mine. His name is Ed Stetzer. And he wrote a book called, he wrote this, it was it, basically a prophetic book. He wrote it in 2018 before all the events of 2020, 2021. But it's called Christians in the Age of Outrage. And I would challenge all of you to read that, cover to cover. 
Don't just start it, not finish it. Read that book. He says a quote in this book, and I want you to hear this. A mature Christian recognizes that correcting every wrong on the internet would take more hours than a full-time job. If you snap every time your great aunt's friend's cousin thrice removed makes a snarky comment about all the contradictions in the Bible, it will consume your joy. There are way too many people that get too offended by this stuff. They get too offended by the world being the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul basically says, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Like the outsiders are the world. Guess what the world acts like? The world. Why are we as the church getting so angry when the world is doing what the world does? Be the world. Full of the flesh. They belong to their father, the devil. The world is doing the world thing and yet we're so angry about it. We're not supposed to get so deeply offended. In fact, it's supposed to cause the opposite in us. It's supposed to bring about grace and compassion. And we'll get to that again in a moment. So often we are taking the bait of the enemy. We're taking the bait to just yell and to cry foul at every offense. Christian, let me ask you, do you find yourself always being offended? Do you find yourself going to your specific watering holes to get offended about things? Listen, think about the next time you watch the news. Are you just getting offended all the time? Now, let me ask you, again, there's, there's righteous anger, no doubt. Or are you just angry all the time, right? This anger doesn't produce God's righteousness. The anger of just being upset all the time, it, it, what's your conversation about all the time? Is it, what's going on in this world? Or are you talking about the grace that God has given you because as they are, you were once just like them. Paul continues, actually he talked about this in 1 Timothy, he told, told the same thing to Timothy, that this quarreling spirit, he's got to stop. 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, well again, he's not telling him to stop, he's saying, hey listen, if you're going to find an overseer or a pastor, that they're not to be a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. So this quarrelsome spirit is something that Paul is telling Titus and Timothy, two pastors, guys, you've got to watch out for this stuff. That quarrelsome spirit is going to ruin you. In 2 Timothy 2, 26 through 24, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Not patiently just tolerating it when you just don't like things. Patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Think about that, church. That our spirit, the way we live and the conduct that we bring to this world should be such that people are drawn in like a moth to a flame to see our good works and glorify God who's in heaven. How are we doing there, church? Are you an attractant or a repellent? Are you drawing people in to Christ through your conduct or are people repelled by you? Continues in verse, verse 2 of First Timothy, or I'm sorry, Titus 3, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. Wow. I don't know about you, but this is a very convicting section of scripture. Because I'll tell you this right now, I aspire to these things, but I ain't there. I am not there yet. There are victories. There are days that I have great victories. There's days that I can look at this and go, yep. I believe I'm non-quarrelsome there. I believe I'm gentle there. I believe I'm in good spirit here. I believe I'm doing the right thing there. And then there's days that I'm not. John Stott, I believe he sums it up best this way in his commentary on Titus. He said, in relation to the authorities, we're to be conscientious citizens, submissive, obedient, cooperative, and in relation to everybody, everybody, not just governing authorities, in relation to everybody, introspect or irrespective of their race or religion, we are to be conciliatory, conciliatory courteous, humble, and gentle. In relation to everybody, irrespective of their race or religion, we're to be conciliatory, courteous, humble, and gentle. How are we doing there, church? 
Do we look like that to the world around us? Let me tell you this. This is something I didn't say last night, but I believe it's something that the Lord would even have you to do. There are probably people in your life right now who you can say, I've ruined my testimony with them because I did not do these things. And I think you could change how people see you by going to them and repenting. Just saying, hey, you know what? A couple of weeks ago, a year ago, five years ago, I really haven't talked to you since then because we had that falling out. And I treated you really poorly, and I'm sorry. I'm a Christian, and I'm not supposed to do that. I, I reflected Christ poorly, and so now I want to write that wrong, and I want to reflect Christ the way he should be reflected. Maybe even read the scripture. I'm not supposed to be quarrelsome. I'm supposed to treat you with love and respect. Even though we disagree on things, I'm supposed to treat you with love. So I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? You want to see how far that goes? Now, they may shut you down. They may say, I don't need your pity. I don't need your forgiveness. I don't need your repentance. Get that nonsense out of here. But guess what? Your conscience is now clear. And what God does, God's going to do. But as far as it goes with you, we are to seek to live at peace with all men. Paul now goes on to tell us why we are to live this way, why we're to treat others with respect, why we're supposed to be gentle and conciliatory and humble and courteous. Verse 3, for we ourselves, we were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. The reason he calls us to be this way, the reason that he tells us that his grace is going to cover, the reason that he calls us to act this way in the world is because y'all were once just like this. I'm telling you, church, listen, I'm not telling you that we have to spend every day uh, reminiscing about the old man. But I also am telling you, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget what God did. Don't forget that such were some of you. We were all at one point enemies of God, enemies of the cross. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we are to reflect Christ in his kingdom, while the world is still a sinner, would we lay down our lives for people who are opposed to God? Would we be gentle and humble and non-quarrelsome? conscientious, loving to people that don't look like us, act like us, think like us, vote like us. In that, it is an attractant. Why do you love me even when we disagree? Why do you show me courtesy when I only give you grief? Why do you treat me so well when I treat you so poorly? Because of what Jesus did in me. Church, that's what we're called to do. That's how we're going to look different. That's how we don't just become a church that's inward focused. It's that our lives become a testimony to God's goodness, his grace, his kingdom, that he has filled us up so much that I'm not worried about offending you. I'm not worried that you're offended by me. I'm worried that God is going to be offended. So I want to be living at peace, not quarrelsome, humble, generous, gentle, courteous to everyone that I meet. And in so doing, it draws people in. Ed Stetzer says this again in his book, Christians in the Age of Outrage. You can't hate people and engage them with the gospel at the same time. You can't war with people and show the love of Jesus. You can't be both outraged and on mission. And I hope that sticks with you, church. You can't be both. They don't exist and cannot exist in the same space at the same time. You cannot be simultaneously hating people and on mission to Share the love of Jesus with them. It doesn't work that way. We have to be on mission, which means we have to love, and we have to give them a love that only Christ can give through us. I've got two points that I want to close with, not the normal three, but I believe these two will give us what we need to take with us today. Number one, our conduct changes when we stop thinking about what we do or don't do and shift our thinking to who we are becoming. I know that's a long point. It's a long statement, but I want you to recognize that here's the thing, a study like this, a, a sermon like this, a message like this, as it's received, y'all sitting there, y'all listening, hopefully, hopefully y'all checked in still. As we listen, when we hear these things and we're not being the way we should be, we can become shut down, right? Because conviction starts rolling in, we don't like the way we feel, and so we can either shut down or there's probably some people who may watch this later, you stop going to church, 
Because when you go to church with God's people, there's conviction, conviction of sin. I don't like that. I don't like the way I feel. So if I just stay away from it, I feel better. Well, that's not a long-term strategy because that road leads to destruction. We all know that. But some of you here today, I don't want you to leave feeling just, oh my gosh, I'm not doing it. I can't handle this. I'm not, I'm not doing well. What I want to do is help you to have tools to get past and to grow. Because some of you, with some of you, the, the, the needle on your spiritual walk hasn't moved in a while. Uh, some of the um, uh, statistics that we got from the Barna Research Study, which first and foremost, thank you to those of you who filled that out. There's about 500 and some odd people that started the survey and didn't fill it out to completion. <laughs> That's the disapproving dad look, just in case you didn't know where that comes from. All that to say, there, we were looking at people's spiritual growth and how they're doing. There's a lot of people, praise God, who are growing, but there's a lot of people who aren't, who are stagnant in their growth. The needle's not moving. It's not moving any further. Why? Because we're so worried that we're not doing it that we just, we, we, we go reclusive and we stop. We, we're, we're focused too much on the sinful issues. And this is why I'll read that point again. Our conduct changes when we stop thinking about what we do or don't do and shift on who we are becoming. What Paul is conveying here to Titus is that the conduct of the present today is something that changes because of what Jesus did. That we're not, you're not called to just be who you are today forever. You are constantly being changed. We talked about it last week, right? Unrighteousness leads to what? More unrighteousness. Righteous living leads to sanctification. Long, big theological term that means from the day that you choose to follow Jesus to the day that you die, you're looking like Jesus more and more every day. That's sanctification. More righteousness, more sanctification. Do you look like Jesus more today than you did 10 years ago? Do you look like Jesus more today than you did last week? Do you look like Jesus more today than you did earlier this morning? Now, a lot of us, I would hope we look more like Jesus at church. But some of y'all putting on the show. Because you're going to leave here and you're not going to look like Jesus anymore. That is going to change. Because not focusing on sin specifically, but focusing on who we are becoming. Listen to this. Romans 12, 2, you've all heard this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He doesn't say be transformed by stop sinning and living as a monk in a monastery so that you're free from every whim, every temptation of this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How do you, how do we transform our mind? the Word of God. We get the Word of God in us and it transforms who we are because we know the lies of the enemy and how he tries to bait the hook. Let me, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here and I hope you'll entertain me for a moment. Too many Christians today talk about their feelings way too much. I, if I had a dollar for every person that came to me and said, you know how I'm feeling, Pastor? I feel this way. And here's the thing. Then I'll ask, why are you feeling that way? Well, because I felt this. And here's the problem. Feelings are a spiral downward. Because if you don't take into consideration and account God's promises of what is true, you then spend too much time focusing in on your feelings and how you're feeling. And then you start going into a spiral of thinking about how you're feeling and then how you feel about how you think about how you've been feeling. And it's a downward spiral to where you're depressed and anxiety because you spend too much time with yourself. You need to spend time with Jesus. Stop spending time with your brain. It's weird. <laughs> your brain's weird. Mine is. I've thought of weird things today. Super weird stuff. Like, where did that come from? It's like a drive. What? You're weird. I'm weird. And if you spend too much time in your brain, you're going to feel weird about your weirdness. You're going to get all worked up. You're going to tell people, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Don't trust your feelings. 
They lie to you. And let me tell you, the enemy of your soul, he wants nothing more than you just sit in your feelings. He wants you to sit there and spend too much time there. Well, I feel this way, oh, bother. <laughs> the, and the enemy's like, yeah, you should feel that way. You're terrible. You're weird. You got weird thoughts. That's all you, man. I didn't even put that there. I don't know. You're just weird, man. And then we get into this downward spiral where we don't take every thought captive. We don't recognize that the Bible says your heart is deceitful above all else. And so we spend too much time in our thoughts. Don't spend too much time there. You're weird. I'm weird. I need to be filled with the Spirit every day or else I'm going to get weirder. I need the Lord's work. Some of you get bogged down in counting sins and thinking today I did better than yesterday, but tomorrow's going to be a terrible day because I got these. Listen, the enemy is trying to hold you back because you're focused on what the do's and don'ts are instead of saying, God, who am I becoming? I read this uh, book this week called The Kingdom Life, and there's a brother named Keith J. Matthews, and he wrote this. Think about this. When I think about the good news of Jesus, two approaches in the form of questions come to mind. There are two contrasting questions that form the shift today from making converts to making disciples. You've heard us talk about make a disciple. We're a disciple-making church. Here it is. Question one. In a conversion-centered gospel, one might ask, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? This question focuses in on crisis events to enact salvation. But then you get to the next question, question two, and it says this. In a disciple-centered gospel, one might ask, if you knew who you were going, that you were going to live forever, what kind of person would you become? What would you like to become, Christian? The second question focuses on the process of growing towards Christ's likeness. One question is concerned with us getting to heaven, while the other one is concerned with who I am right now. If we get the disciple-making piece right, the heaven piece is secure, not the other way around. Too many Christians are focused in on thinking that the goal of the life of a Christian, the goal of salvation is to get to heaven. It is not. I am sorry to disappoint you. The goal of Christianity is not to get to heaven. Heaven is the reward. The goal of Christianity is to be like Christ on this side of eternity. To become more and more like him on the daily. To become more and more like him today than you were yesterday, next week than you were last year. The goal of Christianity, right in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus told him how to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come here. Your will be done here. Not your will be done in heaven and your kingdom come in heaven here. Right here and now. And you, my dear brothers and sisters, are part of that kingdom. To bring that kingdom to come to this earth. The natural man asks, am I sinning? Did my sin keep me from a blessing? How will my sins keep me from getting heaven? The spiritual man will say, what kind of man or woman am I becoming? Do I look more and more like Jesus today? Number two, for those of you struggling with sin, I tell you this, struggling sin, struggling with sin is a proximity problem. I'll say it just as naturally as I can. Every single one of us struggle with sin at different junctures and different times, different types of sin. For those of you that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, I believe our sin that we struggle with becomes different. I think... You know, I kind of like to look at it as like a blue-collar sin versus white-collar sin, right? The, the early sins are, you know, dealing with addiction and drugs and, and sexual tendencies and all those things. That's kind of like the easy stuff to pick out. And then as you grow in sanctification, now you're dealing with your heart. You're dealing with things that you think. You're dealing with the, 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 the deep inner workings of that sanctification because let me just be clear. It's easy to clean up the outside. But Jesus wants to clean up inside and out. Right? Not just that your performance is good on the outside, but that your heart is clean. That he is cleaning out the inside. And so again, my, my contention is that the, the focus of too many Christians is on our sin and not Jesus. So let, let me give you an illustration that I hope will, will kind of bring this into perspective. I've got this picture that I want you guys to look at. Uh, this picture hopefully gives you guys an idea of what I mean. 
Let me ask you a question based upon this picture. Which is bigger in the picture? Your hand, right? The hand is much bigger. But what you know about the Eiffel Tower is the Eiffel Tower is far bigger than this man's hand. The proximity of where his hand is in relation to where the Eiffel Tower is shows you that something's off. And let me tell you, the reason that we often struggle with sin way too much is because we're closer to our sin than we are to God. We know that God's big. We know he's way, oh God, you're so big, you're so grand, you're so wonderful. I've seen all your promises. You're amazing, God. And yet our sin is right here. And we're thinking about it and we're feeling about it. And I feel like my sin and my sin and sins make me feel. My feels are feeling about sin. And, and we're focused so hard, so deep. We're focused in on our sin. This big hand is just right in our face, blocking us. Because our sin doesn't want us to see God. The enemy doesn't want us to see God. Because here's the thing. When you put the hand close to the Eiffel Tower, guess which is way bigger? immensely bigger. God is so much bigger than your sin issue. God is infinitely bigger than all the things that you're dealing with. He's, he's bigger than your depression. He's bigger than your anxiety. He, he's bigger than your feelings about your sin. He's bigger than the sin itself. But the enemy of your soul wants you to focus in on your sin. And when you focus in on your sin instead of the Savior, you're going to be locked into your sin because it's all you think about. And here's what it does. It stunts your growth and makes you regressive. You go backward. Instead of going forward into Christ's likeness and Christ's righteousness and his sanctification, you start going backwards because you're focused on these things. You don't see that. You just put that stuff down. Focus in on God. Know the promises of God. This is one of the reasons why we're supposed to transform by the renewing of our minds, to get the word of God in you. So when the enemy comes and whispers the nonsense, you can tell him via scripture, you're a liar. He's like, no, your feelings are real. You're like, you're a liar. Now, again, your feelings may be real, but that doesn't mean that what the feelings are feeling is real. Oh, you can feel it all day, but it doesn't mean that it's true. Psalm 119, verse 11, one of my faves. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do you keep from sinning against God? Store the word of God in your heart. This is why we believe scripture memorization is vital to memorize God's promises about you. That you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that he formed you from the foundation. He chose you before you were anything. He, he made you in your mother's womb. That he died for you while you were a sinner, that he's placed you as a ruler in this age so that we could be part of the kingdom to come. And gosh, there's so much more. Do you believe those things? Or is your God distant and afar off? You know he's big intellectually, but you've not experienced the vastness of God because you haven't gone towards him. Our problems start shrinking and, and, and diminishing in size comparison the closer we get to him. And I want you to keep that picture in your mind all the time. When you see that proximity issue, I'm too close to my own sin. I need to be closer to the Savior. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul talking about the, the world. He says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And let me tell you, I believe this scripture is also a warning for us who are believers. Because the enemy of our souls loves to blind you. He did it really well while you were sinners, while you were away from God. Now that you're in God, do you think he gives up? No, he doesn't give up. And let me tell you, he's not trying to make you a non-Christian. You know what he's trying to make you? A nominal Christian, an ineffective Christian. Just floating through life with heaven in your back pocket as you get out of hell free card. You're ineffective for the kingdom. He wants you to be effective for his kingdom. Listen, church, my, my imploration to you today is that we would do some heart work, some introspection, some detailed examination of our own hearts and lives and say, God, do I draw people to you? 
Is my conduct in this world one that brings people to the knowledge of Christ Jesus? Or is it one that pushes people away? At the end of the day, the word that Paul is giving to Titus and to us is that we are to be a surrendered people, not for the sake of only our growth and sanctification, but so that those around us will see our good works and glorify our God who is in heaven. When we remember that we were once like them, enemies of God, it gives us more grace, more mercy, and the mindset to grow in giving out all that we have been given flourishes in our lives. You saw me give that illustration last week where God keeps pouring in his grace, and I pray for you, you all understand that God's going to continue to pour out his grace upon you, but we got to have the right perspective. Let's be the people that draw people in. Let's let our conduct be one that draws people into Christ so we can point them to his kingdom. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And, and God, I, I know, Lord, that some of these things are, are they're difficult. We don't necessarily like to hear them. They don't resonate with our flesh at times. Uh, but God, this is, this is the prescription that you've given us in your word. It's the prescription for how we should live in our conduct in this life, God, so that as this world continues to decay and, Lord, there's continually fallout from uh, just poor decisions by people in leadership. God, what it does is as the darkness gets darker, God, the, the light of the gospel and the light of the kingdom in your people, the light of the spirit, it shines brighter because of the darkness that's around us. So God, help us to not uh, capitulate to the culture and start looking like the culture. Help us to stand out from the culture by the way that we live, by the way that we love, by the way that we are asking you every day, God, do I look more like you today? Do I love more like you today? Do people see Jesus in me? Father, we thank you for your, uh, just your word. We ask that your spirit would instill all these things in our heart and God, that we'd be changed by them in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you guys stand up? We're closing this last song.
pray that the love of God will shine through you guys this week. And again, the rest of your life, obviously. But this week is something that we can work on. Let our light shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our God who is in heaven. Be filled with the Spirit, church. Be kind, be compassionate, be loving to the world around us. You never know what they're looking at and when they're going to be attracted to you because of Christ. God bless you, church. If you need prayer for anything, pastors, prayer team members will be up here for you. The rest of you guys have a great day in him. God bless you.